But now the controversy that you've alluded to a couple of times, um, so I, I hit you on the top with a question and, and you took it a different direction. You opened that different <laughs> slope. So we're going to MetaZoo. I know nothing about MetaZoo. You said you did 95, 96% of your business in Pokemon, a little bit in MetaZoo. Some of the, you know, all the guys are now mm -hmm. posting this last week. MetaZoo is dead. Um, and then, of course, the, the clickbait is, is Pokemon next. Um, and I know this is a Pokemon podcast, mm -hmm. but I think it's interesting. You know, we had some, Alex talked about uh, One Piece. And there's, so there's, there's all of these different gaming things. Dan's always talking about when he's buying things, he looks for all the old games that are no longer uh, in, in any valid fashion, just so he can buy the cheapest things out there. So Dan at catch them all. What is the deal with MetaZoo? And is your 4% in business going to go to 0%? Is it really dead or is this all clickbait? It's funny. I um I had a live stream Wednesday night where I just kind of did like a send off. Uh, th there were six main like core sets, and three of which I, I was actually a partner with MetaZoo. So with Pokemon, I'm a retailer. I guess I, I buy Pokemon prints. They sell to a distributor. I buy from the distributor, and then I retail it to the consumer. Right. That's like a very typical chain of uh ch chain of command, whatever movement of product. With MetaZoo, I actually was a partner and how I became a partner, I basically just like, hey, I, I kind of like what you guys are doing. Can I become a partner? I have a little bit of a social media following and I was able to buy product cheaper. So while distribution sold MetaZoo product maybe in the 70s, I was buying it in the 50s. So I, I just saw a business opportunity. Uh, when I was younger, Pokemon was the only thing for me. I never, a lot of people did a little bit of magic, did a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh, maybe a little bit of Digimon, uh, whatever it may be. I never got into anything else, just Pokemon for cardboard. In my years uh, doing Pokemon, the past several years, I've come across collections of Pokemon, primarily Pokemon, a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh, a little bit of Magic, a little bit of Dragon Ball Z, Super, D Dragon Ball Z Score, a little bit of Naruto, all different kinds of things. And I've, I've dipped my toes into them. I've looked at, nothing ever really caught me for whatever reason, for various reasons that I've detailed and I, I don't need to turn this into a huge segment. But um. Certain things with MetaZoo clicked. I, I just genuinely enjoyed it. I thought they were doing some things right. Absolutely. I, I didn't agree with everything they did. Definitely doing some things wrong. But uh, I enjoyed it. And la uh, Wednesday night, I did a send-off stream. Opened one of every six boxes. I pulled like... Well, one thing that I liked that they did, Extreme Chase. So so this card, I know Dan, Dan will know this way better than me. There was an era of Pokemon where they inserted the box topper. I think for certain sets, we had like you were guaranteed to get, I think Power Keepers might've been like a Pikachu or Delta Species might've been a Pikachu on the top yeah. of every box when you opened it. Wasn't Stormfront, was the Charmander, Charmeleon Charizard, no, was that a box topper? Res. Those were just secret. No, they were secret res. The only times they've done box toppers was, so Legendary Collection and the E-Series had the jumbo box toppers. The big it was ones, one of yep. four, One of four different ones in the box. And then through uh, a lot of the EX era, sets had box toppers it wasn't every ex era it was towards the end and i i think they stopped it a few sets before the end of the ex era and it was guaranteed which one you get so every single guaranteed. box you open is gonna okay. have this card sitting loose on top of it yeah whereas the e-reader the, the jumbo box toppers were all one of four right and i think there were three yeah. sets that did it so there were 12 for the whole run um, uh, four sets that did it it was legendary collection and then the three e-reader sets oh okay so, so yeah, anyways, MetaZoo, their first set, they had a box topper. And within that, it was actually a sealed pack. 25,000 boxes. That was one thing I liked about MetaZoo too. Known print runs. I, I came from coins. In coins, you have mintages of every year. The, the San Francisco mint, the Denver mint, the Philadelphia mint. I mean, if you, if you go way back to Morgan City, you, you have the, um, the Carson City, Morgan dollars. And you have, there were different um, mints throughout the different time. But anyways... Known print runs of things was one of those few things that I enjoyed of MetaZoo that, that Pokemon didn't have. And 25,000 boxes created for Cryptid Nation First Edition, 100 box toppers randomly seated. So one out of 250 boxes that you open will have this card. I, I opened the first box to start my stream. I opened the box topper. I pull like at one time that was like a $10,000 card. No idea what it goes for today. Maybe a grand, maybe less, maybe a little bit more. But anyways, like having that just extreme chase, like Moonbrion, that's a chase. That's one in 30 boxes on average. This is one in 250 boxes. That, that, that's just another level, right? So certain things I enjoyed about it. 
Bigfoot, the whole cryptid thing. I live in upstate New York, deep in the woods. Bigfoot's kind of like not a massive deal, but he's a little bit of a urban legend, whatever, around various parts of the world. And I, uh, I just connected with it and I enjoyed it. And stonking and, and scalping and, and all these derogatory things that, that we talk about in Pokemon, maybe they were magnified b- because of when Metazoo was born. And, and maybe some of them, maybe too many of them w- were fed into by the company itself. And and again, we don't need to get, or, or we could get into all that it, it, as much as you want to, or as little as you want to, but th- that is a, a chapter of my business that might be done and it might not be because right now everything's just swirling as things do. And is Metazoo sold? The owner was kicked out maybe, and maybe someone else is buying it and what's going to happen. And I'm more like, same thing in Pokemon. There's all those channels that will just take one hint of rumor, one hint of, and and just run with it and make like 30 videos about it. Uh, I'm more like sit back, wait for the data to come to me. And then adapt, uh, adapt to the new information and figure out how I'm going to proceed. I, I I have this new information that MetaZoo is closed as of Monday, but right in that announcement, it said that it, it might be sold and might continue in the future. So I, I'm just kind of waiting. Uh, but fu- funny thing, the most bullish thing to happen to MetaZoo in, in the past 12 months, what was it closing? Because the amount of orders I shipped out this week at MetaZoo, albeit at a lower price than they were priced last week, what, was fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And um- People are trying to just take that risk of, oh, if it comes back, if it does come back, I want to have my stock ready to go. Or if it... Some amount, absolutely speculating, some amount. Yeah, it's hard to say what the split is, right? Who's speculating, who's collecting, who's investing. Some of these things, I mean, I didn't sell mine that cheaply, but some booster boxes are going for $10, $15. Um, Some of them are going for quite low. And at that point, it's like, uh, I I never gave Medeju a shot because it was always too crazy. Why don't I buy one and just see what it's all about? And, and maybe like 10 bucks, 10 bucks. It's like, let me not go out to lunch today and, and eat a bowl of ramen instead. And I'll buy a Metazoo booster box. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for 10 bucks, I've, I've bought games that looked and were worse than Metazoo. I mean, I've never made a secret that I've never been a fan of Metazoo, but I've for 10 bucks, I've bought games that I know were worse and just opened a booster box just because for 10 bucks, <laughs> like you say, it's 10 bucks. Who cares? It's opening a, a booster box of something rubbish. So yeah, yeah, if people were were dropping them that low, I can definitely see why uh, more people were trying to get into it now because yeah, it's it's no money basically. Um, I I don't think you said this. I I love watching my this these podcasts back because I can actually hear everything you guys are saying. That last ten minutes, I heard nothing. So again, forgive me. Um, I'm I am going to enjoy watching it back. I want to know why in 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 two minutes or less from either one of you. Hopefully, Dan would catch them all. He's more interesting. I want to know why the game, if you're saying that it's likely that it's not going to be there anymore, MetaZoo, why did it fail? So, and the reason I asked this specifically is because if you answered it, my apologies, I don't think you did, but um, but Dan at Norton always says that it starts and ends with the game itself, the gameplay. Um, and so I don't know if there was a gameplay attached to it or was more just a collectible thing, but in your estimation, you know, when you look at one piece or you look at the next, the next 10 games that are going to come out, why did this why did this not go? Why is Metazoo not why is it fading from popularity rather than going the other way? A lot of mismanagement, absolutely. They, they were they were ones to promise way too much and then drastically underdeliver. Missed deadlines on everything. There are products from a year ago that I'd ordered that, that never came and seemingly never coming now. So definitely just uh bad management. And and one thing that I'll say to maybe give them some credit, like I think they launched and this might sound, uh, it, it, it might sound almost completely opposite. And I, I understand that opinion, that take, I think Metazoo being born into the boom, being born into this period of like stonking free money, co- like pandemic craze. Yeah. I think it was like a, a double-edged sword. One, it rocketed it to success some would deem success right like the kickstarter booster box the kickstarter was not funded sub 2500 were printed the next set 25000 then 50000 then 100000 i think the boom propelled it close enough to the sun and they got their heads big enough and and then they got burned they kept the print run too high for too long and so the thing that made them like many people would say the boom made them if not for the boom nothing would have happened and maybe that's true i think the boom made them 
big enough to where their death was certainty because they just got too like swept up in it. And it's a hard thing to navigate. Credit to Pokemon because they're printing 10 billion cards a year and it doesn't seem to be too much. One thing that I constantly say, this stuff is cardboard. This stuff has an intrinsic value of zero. It's all inherently risky. You need someone to buy it from you for more down the line. And I think Pokemon is navigating it very well. There is a number of Pokemon cards that could be printed. And I think a lot of people don't believe this. There's a number that could be printed that would kill Pokemon. Maybe that's a trillion. Maybe that's a hundred times where they're at. Maybe, but there is a number that would kill it because any collectible, if everyone can have it, no one wants it. No matter how many people say I would buy it all if it went to zero, like a lot of people would be gone if they could have everything too easily. Yeah. Wow. That's just some, some, some really interesting commentary. And I, I think it's, well, I'll say I'll say what I was looking at from let's say I wasn't involved in MetaZoo, but looking at it from the outside, I think it does come back to what I've been saying a lot when we've talked about dead games, is that it, it was not focused on players at all. Every post I ever saw about MetaZoo was just I've opened this rare card, I'm flip I'm selling this rare card, I've graded this a ten. I saw basically no one playing it. And the people I did see playing it, it was the attitude towards it was, oh, this is a fine game that I'll play once or twice with my friends. I heard about the the few tournaments that they did. People just weren't interested in it that much. There were issues going on with that. And a lot of just the, the design of the cards in terms of how they played as gameplay mechanics. So many of them just had what I would call as the birthday Pikachu problem. Like people know the birthday Pikachu card. Uh, the idea was you it had an attack where it did 10 damage, but if it was your birthday, it did 50 more damage. Obviously, it was mm. banned from all tournaments because you can't police that in a tournament setting. But when I'm looking through, if I looked through MetaZoo, which I did when it first came out, I looked through it, there's 25 to 50% of the cards in the first set had some weird effect like that where it changed the effect of the card based on the clothes you were wearing or if you were it been to a funeral in the last few weeks or if there were balloons in the room when you've got that kind of thing you cannot have a competitive tournament scene because the game just isn't built for that and the game was so heavily geared towards investors like i know that i know that i've i've talked about this on um quest for 20 with jordan recently actually uh comparing metazoo and flesh and blood when they both jumped in very very early they kind of took a similar tactic in that they both got alpha investments on board. That was one of their first big launches for both of them, is that Rudy from Alpha Investments was a big part of it. And he actually he has cards in both games. There's a flesh and blood card that's Rudy that was for his Patreon people or whatever. And there's I think MetaZoo has a couple now. But Flesh mm. and Blood, as soon as they started to grow as a game, they were they hugely had to change their plan because investors were killing the idea of a gameplay because they were buying up all the first edition print runs and they they couldn't get people playing the game because players couldn't get the cards. Whereas MetaZoo, it seemed they just kept focusing on that investor side and like they, the company themselves were putting out the, oh, this is going to hold value. It's going to worth so much more. This card, this is our Black Lotus. It was what, the Mothman or whatever, I think from the first set. They were like, this is our Charizard. This is our Black Lotus. And investors... When they go into a game, it seems like investors, if they're trying to jump in a game at level one, they're going for the first set. Like you're talking about those Kickstarter edition boxes of set one, first edition of set one. Like, yeah, investors are heavy on that, but how many investors are buying set five, set six? They're not. And collectors as well, you, you say collectors are going for the rarer stuff. So they're going for this stuff that you pull from the boxes that investors are buying because they want the rarest stuff or they want these box toppers and things like you were talking about. They're not going to open 10 boxes of set six if it's nowhere near as popular as set one, if it's not as valuable. You need players. P players are the ones who are going to be buying every set as it comes out because you have to have a tournament scene. You need to make demand for that set the day it comes out. And the way you do that is you say, okay, here's our tournament scene. If you don't have the cards from the new set, you're going to be at a disadvantage to the people who do have the cards from the new set. And if you have no tournament team, you have nothing like that, and you're not focused at all on players, you're never going to keep growing those new sets. And I think that that's the reason a lot of games have died. It's not just MetaZoo. MetaZoo, obviously, I, 
arrogance and <laughs> other stuff, I think, played into it. But I think that's a huge, huge reason that Metazoo died and why we see a ton of games die. I mean, I've said th- I've said that about s- like so much, but I'll say it until I'm blue in the face. You need to get players in. Yeah, your game. And, and I don't know. By the way, I, I'm sitting here as the the audience, knowing nothing about any of the stuff you guys are talking about. But I will say, I guess I don't know that Metazoo has died, right? Because all I've read is and all I've seen is clickbait. So we'll find out if it's actually true in time. Um, but wait, 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 well, wait, wait, Dave, don't. I'll, I'll explain to you, Dave. No, I'm going to explain this bit to you. The reason people are saying it's died now is this. The company has come out and said, we are no longer producing Metazoo. We are like liquidating the company that was making it. They've shut down all their social medias. They've deleted their Discord and their Twitter. That's why people are saying it's died. So from that perspective of, is the card game alive and continuing to be made? No, like that's flat out. It is currently dead. It is currently not a in production product so that we can't even say it's in the hospital on life support dan i mean we're going straight up to six feet under yes they deleted their discord and twitter and said what this company no that longer exists okay, okay wait Hold Hold i think up. how many celebrities have deleted their their social media because they've got some flack for something and they eventually come back okay i gotta move on to dan and catch them all just let it go That was a clip from Coffee Talks, a Pokemon card collecting podcast. Check out the full episode here, or see a playlist of all our episodes. We hope you enjoy!